Okay, now that we've looked at our motivating example, which is to try to diagnose breast cancer from a sample, let's look at our first type of classifiers called linear classifiers. All right, before we do that though, let's just talk about what we mean by classification in general. Now we covered this in unit one, just as a recap. What you have is you're given a vector of features x. So for example, in the breast cancer case, that would be the vector of 10 features of the sample. And then in general, you want to determine its class label, which we denote by y. In the special case of binary classification, there are only two choices. And for example, in the breast cancer case, that would be either it is benign or malignant. But if you were, say, grading the breast cancer, you might give it four levels or something like that. Now, classification has many applications. It's used, of course, in medical diagnosis, but it's used, for example, in face detection, as I've shown here. So in this case, you're given a square of some image, and you're supposed to determine, is there a face in that image or not? Or maybe you're given a handwritten digit, like we did in Unit 1, and you want to determine is the digit 0 to 9. So in this case, there would be 10 um, classes. Or maybe is some email spam. So all of these ones are things that we've talked about, although we haven't implemented them yet. Mathematically, what we're doing is we're saying, I have this vector of features, x, and I want to learn a function f of x, which maps each x to one of the k classes. And I'm going to label that predicted class by y hat. So if it were a two-dimensional case, I would have x1 and x2. And maybe these are the data points. I have to learn the function. And the function could look like this. So say for all of the points on this side of the boundary, it would be one, and all of these points, it would be zero. This is not the function itself. That is just the boundary. The function takes every x and maps it to zero or one. Of course, there are different ways to index. Sometimes you start with one, sometimes you start with zero, um, but the principles, of course, are the same. All right, with that general discussion about classification, let's take a look at what we mean by a linear classifier. And we'll just look for now, just in the binary case, which means that I have, again, I have data like this, and I want to learn a function which just outputs one of two class labels, zero or one. Now, there are many functions that can do this, by a linear classifier, we have a very specific form. It takes in two phases. The first is you take a linear combination of your data. So this is just like what we did in regression. We have some weights and an intercept, and we'll call that output z. At this point, we have a real value number. But then I predict the class from the following, which says that when z is positive, I'll label it as 1, and when it's negative, I'll label it as 0. Visually, you can think of it like this. The points where z is equal to 0 are always going to be a straight line. And then the points where it's greater than 0 are going to be on one side of the line, and the points where it's less than 0 on the other side. Both of those two regions are called half spaces. So what a linear classifier is doing geometrically, it is finding some line, if it were 2D, or in general some plane, and splitting the space into these two half spaces and calling all the points in one half space one label and all the other points in the other half space another label. That vector of coefficients, which defines where this line is located, we'll call the weight vector. Now, let's just apply that concept to our breast cancer. 
In the breast cancer case, well, there were 10 dimensions, but just for visualization, we looked at two of them. So size, uniform, and margin. Now, I left off the last section and asked you to write a classifier on your own. Now, you might have had a lot of different rules, but maybe some of you inadvertently actually wrote a linear classifier. So here's one that, uh, that would work pretty well for this case. Just visually, I'm going to say, look at, look at the data. We have all the benign samples seem to be on this lower left part, and all the malignant ones are on the right part. So if I had to guess a rule in general, I might say I'm going to draw a line somewhere here and say the points below that are benign and the points above that are malignant. So one possible equation for that line could be like this, all right? And if you wanted to draw that line, it would be like this. And then all the points that are in that half space are um, drawn in this hatched surface. Now, why is this a um, linear classifier? Well, I could write it mathematically as follows. I could say, well, this rule up here is equivalent to the following. I'm going to take a linear combination of my two data um, features, all right, like this, with the correctly chosen coefficients. It's one times the margin plus two thirds times the size, and there's a minus four intercept. It's important to get these signs right. And then from this, I'm going to say y hat is one with the convention that one means malignant um, when this value is positive and it is zero when it is negative. So I've just rewritten this rule that I can just draw here in math. So that should be fairly straightforward. Now, if I wanted to code it up in Python, that's pretty easy. We'll use the sklearn um, convention that this would be like the predict function. And now if I gave you a data matrix of samples, X, um, I could implement this as follows. I would get the margin and size from the first and the zeroth um, column of that X. I would compute my Z with this formula and then compute my Y hat by looking at the sign of Z. Just a weird Python um, aspect is that you have to convert that boolean value to an integer. That's all this syntax does. Now, if I wanted to test it out, take my data x, I run the predict function, and it will give me what it thinks the labels are, and I can compare that to what the actual labels are, and lo and behold, I get 92.6% accuracy. So our linear classifier did pretty well and this was a linear classifier that was only using two of the 10 features. I'm gonna show you by the end, when we look at all 10 features, if you have a well-designed linear classifier, you can even be much higher, closer to like 98%. All right, but the questions for today then is, well, this was easy to do by hand because I could just visually do it. But if I had all 10 features, I would have to think in 10 dimensional space and that would be too hard. The question is how do we do this when we have many more features that we can actually visualize. And in this space, how do we fit really an optimal linear classifier? How should we select those coefficients, particularly when you can't find one that does well on all the data points? And for that matter, what is optimal? So these are the things we're going to look at. But before we do this, let's just do a couple more properties about linear classifiers. The first thing to recognize is that linear classifiers are not the be all and end all of all classifiers. In fact, they have their limitations. So first aspect here is that linear boundaries are limited. So for example, if your data look like it does an A, this is great for a linear classifier because you can draw a straight line and it seems to align well, at least with this training data. But if my training data looked like B, I would want to draw maybe a circle around that to characterize the regions which are blue. But obviously you can't do this with a straight line. 
So you can really only describe in some sense very simple regions with linear classifiers. Nevertheless, it's really good to start with linear classifiers because they're an excellent building block, and particularly a lot more complex techniques that we'll cover even in this class, like neural networks and decision trees, use linear classifiers as one component, and then they make more sophisticated decisions by using multiple cl linear classifiers in some kind of sequence. Another point that I want to talk about is the idea of perfect linear separability. And it's just this. It's, suppose I have data like this, and I'm going to draw it again. So this is a two-dimensional data set. And I have a number of points, the green points in one label and the red points in another label. And I say that it's perfectly linearly separable if I can find some linear classifier that makes no errors on the training data. Now, visually, it's very easy to understand that. It's just I means in the 2D case that I can draw a line that splits the data and no red points are on the green side of this line and no green points are on the red side of this line. If you want to be mathematical about it, it means that I can find a weight vector such that after I take a linear combination of the samples, all the points on one side will be positive and all for all the points on the other side, that linear combination will be negative. Now, here's something that students always screw up, but it's just you can review your geometry. W is not somehow the um, vector along the line. Remember that whenever I draw a line like this, the w is the normal vector, or more precisely, the coefficients from one w1 to wd is the normal vector in that case. So keep that in mind. And the w0 tells you about where that is in terms of the position of that line. All right. Now, one point that should be clear about this from the previous slide is that many times the data is you're not perfectly separable. So here I have um, some data which is perfectly separable. So I can draw a line, or actually a couple of different lines, that splits the blue points from the red. But there's other cases which is more common where it's not separable. So for example, if I try to draw this line, one of these red bars comes on one side and one of these blue crosses comes on the other um, sides. sides. And this means that whatever linear classifier I choose, there's always going to be at least one point that is misclassified. And that raises the question then, well, how do you find good hyperplanes? Maybe what you try to do is reduce the number of misclassified points, or maybe some other type of metric. We'll get to that in the next unit. Another issue with linear classifiers is their non-uniqueness. So even when one exists, the separating hyperplane may not be unique. So for example, just consider the figure on the right. Here we have a number of red points and blue points, and you can clearly linearly separate them. But obviously you can separate them with many different lines. So there's not one single line that in general separates the data points. Another case where you can get non-uniqueness is just by scaling. So if you have any W that separates your data and you just scale it by some positive constant alpha, it will still separate it because at the end we're only caring about the sign. Now, both of these um, examples illustrate a general issue, which is if we have many separating hyperplanes, how do we select among them the one that is optimal? This is something we're going to address in the next unit. But before you do go on, sorry, the next section, 
Before you go on, I want you to just do this very simple sample problem. It's here on the slides. It's also in the GitHub site. Should be super easy just getting an idea that you understand um, what is linear separability. Um, the solution is also on the site. And when you go get through that, go ahead to the next section.